ourselves real fast before we get started on the panel this morning. My name is Arjuri, and I am the West Eugene Community Organizer for Beyond Toxics, and I'm excited to speak with you all today. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Zach Mulholland. I'm a clean air project assistant with Beyond Toxics, working on clean air and climate issues here in the city of Eugene. And my name is Mason Levitt. I am our GIS coordinator and cartographer. Okay, thanks again, everybody. Uh, like I said, I'm Arjuri Arberry Barbo, and I am the West Eugene Community Organizer for Beyond Toxics. We are going to speak with you today about two very important topics, one of those being the public health overlay zone and the next being new gas station moratoriums. Um, I'm going to start by offering you a little history of West Eugene, and then my partners are going to delve into the nitty-gritty of some things. So the West Eugene neighborhood, also called Bethel, is sandwiched in between the concentrated areas of uh, industrial pollution, I'm sorry, concentrated areas of industrial pollution along West 11th and Highway 99. Um, Highway 99 and West 11th, uh, West Eugene out in that area is heavy uh, industrial out that way. And so what happens when folks are surrounded by these facilities is that they put off these emissions and those emissions, the air currents carry them onto the residents. And so that's why we're wanting so much there to be a public health overlay zone. So let's see how our work in West Eugene, the West Eugene uh, corridor has helped us develop a narrative around gaps in a narrative around gaps in policies and laws. Eugene has two cities with one geographic location. There's Green Eugene, which is the University District, College Hill, Southwest Hills, and downtown. Then there's the West Eugene Industrial Corridor, surrounded by Superfund sites, groundwater plumes, the rail yard, and the intersection of three state highways. Um, folks in Green Eugene are often blissfully unaware of the BIPOC and low-income uh, low uh, community out in West Eugene, whose neighborhoods have been negatively impacted by living, close in, by living in close proximity to industrial facilities. So you see one house here on the left is a home in, it's on my left, is a home in West Eugene. And you can see the one in East Eugene is a little bit more extravagant and um, looks a lot nicer to live in. That's not the type of houses that we have out in West Eugene. Oh, sorry, there it goes. Okay. Um, in the 1940s, the Willamette River was the northern edge of the city of Eugene. And this is an aerial photo of Ferry Street Bridge and Alton Baker Park. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But um, here on my right, uh, are you at my pointer? Okay. Here on my right, the screen here is, um, it's, an aerial it's an aerial photo of where families lived and were relocated. The one there on the left is um, how it used to be in 1947, and the newest photo that we have here is 2019. Alton Baker Park is right off of Ferry Street Bridge, and that's where a lot of the families lived when they moved to um, Eugene until they, before they were relocated. One of the families that we're gonna talk about that was relocated is, um, uh, I'm sorry, one of the families that we're gonna be talking about today that was relocated is, are called the Reynolds family. And we'll get into a little bit of their history here in just a bit. Um, this here is a map of Ferry Street Bridge, Skinner's Butte, West 11th, and um, Glenwood, and in 1949, city officials leveled the Ferry Street community before the community would voluntarily leave. So they relocated them and demolished that area before the families were ready to um, locate from that area. So the city members and community members moved Ferry Street residents to Skinner's Butte, and at the time, that was the city's poorest neighborhood in 1949. Um, as I said, they were forcibly moved from that area. Um, both West Eugene and Glenwood are highly industrialized today. Glenwood is mostly incorporated in Springfield, so we won't talk too much about um, Glenwood today. 
One of those families that I told you about that was relocated that we're going to focus on a little bit here are called the Reynolds family. And the fellow that you see here is named Sam Reynolds. And right after World War II, um, black families moved from Portland to Eugene searching for work in the timber industry uh, when they were being fired from some of the shipyards and ports in Portland. And that one of those families were the Reynolds family. And this is Sam Reynolds, and he was a leader in the black community. And he and his family were one of the first families to be relocated to West Eugene. He was also a businessman and invested in the lumber industry. However, he was completely excluded from the booming industry and prevented from having ownership in any mill or lumber business, while other, fo while other folks in the lumber industry at the same time were making fortunes. This is an example of how environmental, environmental racism curtails economic opportunity, which allows folks who do not live in low-income areas to gain wealth and precluded, black, and precluded, precluded BIPOC and low-income families from doing the same. This photo here is really sweet and really cute because I've actually met several of these um, people that are in these photos. This, was a fo this is a photo of the Reynolds children. And um, I'm sorry, just give me one second here. Okay, sorry about that. Not only were black families, um, not only were African American businessmen re prevented from owning businesses, they were also prevented from owning, or from owning, from renting or buying homes within the city limits. People of color were pushed out to the swamps, the swamp areas far outside the city limits. And these are some of the children that I was telling you about with the Reynolds. Um, they were actually evicted from what was called Tent City in North Eugene and sent to live in West Eugene, which was an area where they dumped sawmill waste in the wetlands of West Eugene. And pictured here are three of the Reynolds children. Um, the one on the left there, the, the son, I haven't actually met him, but I've met the two gals. And the one on the right there with her brother, her name is Dolores. And you can see the two of them carrying giant water jugs because the area where they lived did not have water that was safe for, for them to drink. So they had to walk like a mile and a half to go get water that, that was drinkable. And you can imagine that that was very heavy. And these are, these are small children carrying those water jugs. So I've met Dolores, and I've met the little gal here, Lily, on the right. And the two of the sisters still live together and have told many stories to me um, and some other folks at Beyond Toxics about their lives and their lives out in West Eugene. And they never wanted to be pitied. They never wanted to be thought of as somebody that was inadequate. They just, they made the best of what they had and they never forgot where they came from. So it's interesting to meet these women and see that they were such staples in the black community and that they're now, um, their story after all this time is still being told, which is, I think, pretty fantastic. This area that you see here is that marshland that I was telling you about. This is the area where the families like the Reynolds were relocated to in West Eugene. Um, this was far beyond where the, raves, the, the roads were paved and there was no city lights. It was just nasty marsh land um, that was unlivable. There was no running water, sewage, lighting. Um, you can imagine in the nighttime, if you had to get up and go to the restroom, that would be pretty dark and scary, especially as a child. So that's one of the, you know, that's pretty impactful. I wish that it was in color so that you can see it, but of course this was 1952 when this photo was taken. So the families like the Reynolds, they were relocated to West Eugene, and they were not issued permits. The city would not issue permits for them to dig wells in West Eugene. Um, because the water level got too high and it yielded brackish and muddy water, like I said, that was unsafe to drink. Nobody wants to drink that water. That looks disgusting. Nobody <laughs> wants to drink that. Here's a couple more of the Reynolds children, and who knows what's in that water, right? We're going to discuss a little bit about what could be in that water later on in the presentation. presentation. But they're just innocent kids. They're probably played in that water, not knowing that it could have anything to do with impacting their health in a negative way. Um, so you can see here that the Reynolds paid $70 a month for a $3,500 mortgage for a home that was built on two by fours and um, sunk in the mud. So not only could they not purchase a home, they couldn't purchase a home if they wanted to that was in a safe spot, that wasn't muddy, that wasn't moldy, that wasn't unsafe for them to live. OK. 
Okay, and this is a beautiful map that Mason made. We'll talk a little bit more about what he does a little later in the presentation, but as you can see on this map, Communities in West Eugene have grown through the decades. Um, we work closely with neighborhood associations like um, Active Bethel Citizens, the West Eugene community. Um, we do some work out in Santa Clara, River Road, and Train Song. Um, we, in, we want to emphasize that ABC, the West Eugene community, and Train Song neighbors are the most that are impacted. Um, in that neighborhood. So are you pointing a little bit to the maps there? So you can see the, you can see where West Eugene is and Active Bethel Citizens and all that, and we work really close with them, and they're the most impacted. This map here shows, we can see how many people of color live in these areas. The lightest shade of yellow is between the state and city average. The darker yellow and orange and red are areas that are above, that are above composition of people of color. The bluer shades and areas, the bluer shades are areas that point out, um, the bluer shades are areas with less people of color in Eugene. In this map, we are, um, there are three things that are symbolized. One, we have the red area, which shows the industrial zoning and a quarter mile buffer into incompatible neighboring zones um, it, into incompatible neighboring zones, which includes residentials, parks, public land use for schools, and community gatherings. Over that, we can see that the neighborhoods mentioned in the previous slide, um, we want to point out that ABC, Trainsong, West Eugene, Santa Clara, and River Road are some of the most impacted. Lastly, you can see the little um, black dots there. Those are the air contamination discharge permits and Title V permits, and you can see that they are concentrated in the West Eugene area along the, high, along the corridors of Highway 99 and West 11th. Okay, whoop. I've shared a little bit about, laid sort of a foundation for you there. I'd like to show this video to you to sort of open up the gate for us to talk about J.H. Baxter. Due to the placement of many poor workers in Northwest Eugene, close to the Baxter plant and Seneca Mills and other places like that, and Highway 99, which is a major thoroughfare, you really do have a huge life expectancy difference between folks who live in the South Hills and people who live there. And then you also see where they work. So it becomes this very stratified picture of society right here in little old Eugene, uh, which is a wonderful, beautiful city. But if you're poor, uh, you really do get to see uh, that starkness. We're sitting at the Mims house. This whole property, in many ways, is associated with the first mill here, which was a money maker, and which made Eugene the county seat. So all this is part of not only how black folks are treated in America, or have been treated in America, but as workers, because black people are the quintessential workers in America. And anybody came after them and had to be a low class or just a, a menial worker, basically you became an honorary black person. And that's how you were treated. So when we talk about leveling in those playing fields, not even about just black people, we're talking about our Native Americans, we're talking about leveling the playing field for poor people. And so when you look at West Eugene, and Springfield, you have specific industries that need workers. And those industries really like the workers to be close <laughs> to the industry, which we know and many times is not a good thing if that industry is, is polluting as a byproduct. So it's advantageous for companies to have their workers close. At the same time, that puts them into proximity of any pollutants that that company may be producing. And we have that example <laughs> at Baxter, and there had been for years studies showing higher levels of health uh, disparities in the neighborhood. And so for now, they have admitted that this is something that they can't afford to clean up and that they can't fix. I myself used to live in that neighborhood, and that was 30 years ago, and it was a problem then, and now it's good to see that a solution has been had, and that is just shutting them down. Right? Leaving. You got to go somewhere else. But they have to mitigate those lands. And so we're happy to see that they are shutting down shop and moving.
but this is long past due. Another piece that I've understood is that we have to ask business and government who work hand in hand a lot of time to build infrastructure or to build the, the work labor force to put the workers first. And so in many ways, this is a workers issues. This is a humanitarian issue about how we treat those people who build and sustain our society. The gentleman that was speaking on that video is the former exec executive director of the NAACP here in Eugene. His name's Eric Richardson, and so we're very thankful that he was able to make that video for us and help it sort of set a foundation for what we really want to talk about. Not that we didn't want to talk about the history of West Eugene, but I wanted to just give you a little, a little foundation so that we can see why a public health overlay zone is so important in that area, and potentially citywide. This is J.H. Baxter. It is right across the street from residents in West Eugene. Um, this photo, if you were standing across the street and taking this photo, that you would be taking it from a, bi -pack, a, bi -pa a bike path or someone's backyard. You could see the facility straight from their backyard. So you can kind of see how close that is to folks. Folks should not be living this close to a facility like this, and they are. J.H. Baxter is, um, it's a 31 acre facility that is no longer active. They were able, they were shut down January 31st of 2021. But during the time that they were in operation, this facility has had problems with air emissions and um, historical spills have polluted the groundwater in the nearby neighborhood. This has caused a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, a lot of angst for the residents that live in that area who are concerned about the possible health impacts that they could be experiencing living so close to this facility. This is an aerial photo of that neighborhood that I was telling you about that's right across the street from J.H. Baxter. This is a photo looking over the top of that neighborhood. So just imagine now we're standing in J.H. Baxter's property and we're looking out and that's this is what they're looking out and seeing are these homes um, people's homes oh, I should also say that uh, in 2020 the DEQ found high levels of dioxin in the soil near JH Baxter and some of the residents um, in some of their soil as well and dioxin is a group of highly toxic chemicals that, form, that can be formed during industrial processes like J.H. Baxter did with their wood treatment. And uh, dioxin is a known carcinogen. This graph that you're seeing here is something that's really cool that got worked out um, because of the work of Beyond Toxics and the community uh, out in West Eugene. We asked them to do a graph that, showed, that shows folks exactly what levels of dioxin are and what levels they can harm you. So you see there down at the bottom is 4.7 parts per trillion. You know, something might happen. 40, 40, point, 40 parts per trillion is where we start to get worried. There are seven yards that have levels of 47 parts per trillion. Seven homes. So they're above that. And what the, o the OHA's level for increased risk for children um, at a level that high is um, for six years old and younger could be experiencing, later in life they could experience reproductive problems um, being exposed to dioxin, as well as maybe getting sick from cancer. So the DEQ had planned to move, to remove the soil in 2022, but they did some further investigation and found that the soil had gone deeper, the dioxin had gone down deeper in the soil than they had imagined. So instead of being able to remove that soil in June of 2022, we're having to do more testing to see exactly how far that has gone down. And in some cases, we might need to go as much as three feet. Initially, we thought 12 inches. Now we're talking three feet. That's a huge difference. It's a huge difference. Also, because of the work of J, uh, because of the work of Beyond Toxics and the West Eugene community, we were able to have the OHA do a 
um, a cancer analysis. So they had performed one back in between, they had performed one in 20, 20, 2006, 2008. We asked them to do another one in 2021 to incorporate other, other types of cancers. They had done 22 types. We asked them to do a couple more and to add a couple more on there that we were particularly concerned about because of living close to J.H. Baxter, because of the pollution. We were concerned about instances of lung cancer and Hodgkin's lymphoma, at which time they found that there were higher levels of both of those, bigger cases of um, Hodgkin's lymphoma and lung cancer right there next to Baxter. Um, I can't, you know, they didn't say there's a cancer cluster. We're not saying that there's a cancer cluster in West Eugene, but um, they did find that those levels were higher uh, right there next to the facility. Well, let's talk a little bit about what they did here. So this is an enforcement of their, uh, all the fines that they'd received between 1993 and 2020. Uh, you can see some of these have zeros. Some of them have just a little slap on the hand. One, they did receive a fine for $1,300 in 1994 for illegal open burning, a waste discharge limit, limitation violations in 91 and 93. You can see that's zero. They just said, don't do that again, zero dollars. They also got a zero dollar fine in 2020 and 2010 for a broken discharge from a water pipe, from a broken pipe. They also got a zero, in, they also got a zero dollar fine for an air violation in 2012. Also a zero dollar fine in 2017 for mishandling hazardous materials. The largest fine that they received was $25,000. And it matched the, sign, the fine that they received for zero dollars for the air violation permit. So the largest fine that they received was $25,000 and it should have been that fine all the way back in 93 and it was zero dollars. So they got away with it for all that time. So you can see this, this company has a history of getting fines, paying them, not paying them, and continuing to operate um, illegally. And that brings us to the latest uh, big dollar fine that J.H. Baxter has received. In March of 2021, the DEQ uh, fined J.H. Baxter um, $223,444 for hazardous waste and water quality violations. I want to point out that $178,905 of that was from burning off 1.7 million gallons of hazardous waste between 2015 and 2012. I personally don't think that that would have happened had they not been doing, getting away with all that. 1.7 million gallons, folks, of hazardous waste burning off into that neighborhood that I showed you. For a long time, they did that. Oh, and because they, they, they don't pay their stuff, right? So their, their fine has been increased to $305 for $305,444. That's a drop in the bucket for this company, though. That's nothing. That's minuscule. That's not even somebody that has cancer. That's not even their doctor bills. That's, that's nothing. They still haven't paid that. They still haven't paid it. And um, unfortunately, the, uh, unfortunately, the owner of that company, Georgia Baxter, is not showing that she has, she's not taking, initiating any moving forward to be able to pay those fines. So it's being left sitting there for the residents to look at and see and say, well, what's going to happen to my neighborhood? Because we're being held under the thumb of this company that has you know, polluted the neighborhood for decades and they're still sticking it to them. So the site at Baxter has not been cleaned. Um, and like I said, Georgia Baxter has not initiated any steps to do so. Um, so like I said, they're shut down. 
What are we going to do about it, though? They're shut down. They're still sitting there. What's going to happen? Well, we're going to get things cleaned up a little bit. <laughs> it's going to take decades to clean it up at all, if ever. But <clears throat> we are going to do some things to alleviate some of that stress for the, for the uh, community. So as I mentioned before, the DEQ and the EPA identified seven homes that would need um, to be cleaned up sooner or later. They had those dioxin levels above 40 parts, parts per trillion. Thankfully, there are no children that live in these homes because as I said before in the, uh, earlier in my part of the, the uh, presentation, that's when you, children can have, uh, later in life, they can have reproductive, re reproductive problems. And um, I'm gonna share something real quick before I move on. I have a friend who grew up in West Eugene, went to Bethel, went, you know, was always in West Eugene. And she has had several friends who have cancer, who have died from cancer. And just before I had this presentation yesterday on my way down from Portland, she sent me a text message and she said to me, I feel like my days are numbered. I feel like, when am I gonna get that call? Because she had just gotten a phone call right before she called me from one of her friends that she went to high school with at Willamette High School, which is in West Eugene. She got diagnosed with very rare breast cancer, two different types, and she's young. I mean, we're, we're in our 50s, <laughs> that's young. So anyway, I just wanted to share that with you because this is something that can cause a lot of problems later in your life. Like that's, she's in her 50s and now being told, yes, you have breast cancer. And not only do you have breast cancer, you have a really rare breast cancer that's gonna be hard for us to do anything about. They said she's got 10 months, maybe. And she grew up in West Eugene. She went to school in West Eugene. She swam in West Eugene. She played in the parks in West Eugene. So we're gonna get those areas cleaned up um, as much as we can. As I said, the sev there's seven homes that have been identified with dioxin levels that are way too high. And originally, as I said, the regulators thought that they were gonna have to go 12 inches. Now they're gonna have to go as much as three feet. The sampling will take place with this little contraption that you see here, it's called a geoprobe. And that's what the folks in um, West Eugene will see when they're getting their yards sampled. I'm glad that it's not a huge, like, I was imagining something a lot bigger than that when they were talking about doing the, um, the sampling, but I'm glad it's not as intimidating as it would be if you had people coming in with like, space suits and making sure that they're not getting soil on them and all that. That would seem a little bit more scary to me. Um, it's already scary, but this doesn't seem nearly as intimidating. So they're gonna start doing some more sampling. Um, the sampling should be done by April 6th and hopefully then we will know how much soil needs to be removed at that point. Um, the testing results may not be back until May or June, and at that time we'll, be, we'll really know what, what we're gonna do with those yards and how, how much it's gonna take to clean it up. One of the problems that we're having with removing the soil and being able to put back soil is that there's not enough soil to replace the soil that they're removing. That tells you something right there. There's not enough soil to put into the yards to replace this. I mean, that's crazy to me. That, that's, there's a lot of dirt in the world. So they have to make sure that, there's, that that dirt's not contaminated because we don't want to just take dirt and put it somewhere and then put more dirt in there that's contaminated. Like, it, it's, it's a mess. It's a mess. It's a mess that could have been avoided if that company had not been, remember all those fines? all those zero dollars. I'm not saying that, this, that these people may not have had cancer. I'm not saying that they wouldn't have gotten cancer at any other points. But I'm saying their lives were put up for debate. So this, like I said, the site of Baxter has not been cleaned up. Um, there's been talk about a super fund and like I said, the EPA is involved now and with the APA comes dollars. So. We're, you know, we're working tight to see what we can do. There's a lot of fear in that neighborhood. There's a lot of fear and there's a lot of anger and I get angry with them and I'm sad for them. 
zero dollars. One of the folks that I'm super proud to know and excited to know, her name is Andrea, and she is a member of the community who has stepped up and spoken out. She's given testimony at city council meetings. She's met with the mayor. She's met with myself and Zach with city councilors to tell her truth and speak her story because it's her home. West Eugene is her home. She can't just pick up and move. That's not realistic. Everybody can't just leave. So she's hoping that this public health overlay zone will be implemented to be able to um, protect her family, to protect her neighbors, to protect her future grandchildren. She's living in a house that she wants to continue to live in. Had she known that there was property, that there was damage in that property, she maybe not would have moved there. And then there's me. Does that lady look familiar? <laughs> That's me. So in 2018, my daughter, who you see there, her name is Zion, she was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. She's cancer-free now, let me start with that. She's cancer-free now, but if you remember, Hodgkin's lymphoma was one of those cancers that were elevated right out um, near J.H. Baxter. So that's what started my journey in this, because I couldn't understand why she was sick. Um, there's no history of cancer in our family. So I started to get investigated. I'm, I'm nosy, so I started to look around and I found out about J.H. Baxter, which led me to be on Toxics, which led me to be here to speak with you today. But I speak out for my community. I speak out for my neighbors. I speak out for families like mine, because Nobody needs to sit and see their child go through that. This little baby had to have a stem cell transplant to be able to keep her alive. That was the last thing that could have been done for her. Had that not worked, I would be standing here with a different story. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much for that, Audrey, for that background, uh, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, my name's Zach. Uh, as I said, I'm the uh, work on climate policy and clean air policy with Beyond Toxics. Um, so I'm just going to give a little bit more background on sort of uh, why West Eugene and why we're focusing on this policy, and then dive into some of the details of how a public health overlay zone would work, uh, and then I'll pass it off to Mason to talk a little bit about uh, gas stations. Uh, so this is a map of the worst industrial polluters in Eugene from Cleaner Air Oregon, uh, which is run by the DEQ. Uh, and so this is the most dangerous facilities in Eugene uh, ranked by risk. Uh, <clears throat> and you can see that there's a, a concentration of industrial facilities in West Eugene, uh, especially along between Highway 99 and the Northwest Expressway, and between Roosevelt and West 11th, uh, generally uh, adjacent to the railroad tracks uh, running through town. Uh, Eugene has a, a, a <clears throat> unique program called the Eugene Toxics Right to Know program where we require industrial polluters to report on their toxic emissions in the city of Eugene. Uh, and specifically, there's a, a, it looks at the air toxics that are emitted to, or the toxics that are emitted to the air. So this is the data for 2021 uh, <clears throat> uh, on the map there. Uh, and you can see that there's a massive disparity in the air toxics that are going into different areas of Eugene, uh, with West Eugene uh, emitting about 94%, uh, over 94% of the air toxics emissions emitted to the air in 2021. Uh, and you can see in the small graph at the bottom that those emissions have been trending up over time in that area code, uh, so they're, they're not going down. <clears throat> uh, that is uh, closely associated with a number of other factors. Uh, Eric Richardson in the video mentioned lower life expectancy rates in West Eugene. Uh, Train Song specifically has the third lowest life expectancy in the state at 70.2 years uh, compared to the Fairmont University, uh, Fairmont neighborhood uh, south of the UO, which has the third highest life expectancy in the state uh, at 87.9 years. Uh, this is also seen when looking at poverty and asthma rates. So the zip codes marked in red are both in the top 10% of lowest income households and in the top 10% for the highest asthma rates nationwide. 
Uh, many zip codes in Eugene have some of the highest asthma rates in the country. Uh, so uh, Clear Lake Overlay Zone as a model, uh, you know, I, I think Ardrey gave a good background on the J.H. Baxter facility and uh, the harms that it has imposed on the West Eugene community. There are a number of other industrial polluters in West Eugene. And one of the questions is, how do we stop new industrial polluters from moving into this area? Uh, that J.H. Baxter site is uh, going to be cleaned up, hopefully, by the EPA and the DEQ, but there's a big question mark of, you know, what happens next to that property? Are they going to sell that to another wood preservation facility or some other type of industrial polluter that's then going to have the same type of negative impacts on the neighboring, neighboring communities? Uh, so the model that we've been looking at is uh, what's referred to as the Clear Lake Overlay Zone. Uh, and <clears throat> As some background, when the city was looking to expand its urban growth boundary in 2017 to bring new industrial lands into the city, along with some additional areas for parks and for schools, <clears throat> uh, they put some rules into place to say, let's make sure that we don't have the same issues in this area that we've seen in other parts of Eugene. So they put in rules to ban the worst potential land uses, including things like wood preservation, uh, and they also said that in the areas closest to homes, parks, and schools, they were going to make sure that the manufacturing was done inside. Uh, so you don't see some of those uh, <clears throat> impacts on neighbors from noise and uh, odors and pollution that we've seen at other areas like J.H. Baxter. Uh, just at a very high level, in, uh, what is an overlay zone? Uh, if you've heard of other zoning types like industrial or uh, commercial or, or residential, an overlay zone is an additional layer of zoning that uh, rests above that. So uh, in this area, in the Clear Lake overlay zone, there's a combination of lands that were brought in, both employment, uh, campus employment zones, the E1, as well as uh, medium industrial, the I2 zoning. And the Clear Lake overlay zone is an additional layer of zoning that sits on top of that, that uh, sort of supersedes and affects those base zoning rules <clears throat> uh, by banning these worst land uses uh, and requiring manufacturing to be done indoors uh, south of Clear Lake Road, those E1 properties. Uh, and then just uh, some background, the, the dark gray here at the bottom uh, around the lakes, that's destined to become the Golden P Garden Ponds Park. Uh, it's going to be developed in, uh, into a sports complex. Uh, to the west of that, the public land, that's going to be a, a K through 8 school. Uh, so there's a real desire. Uh, and then south of all of that is the Bethel neighborhood. Uh, and so there's a real desire to make sure that as <clears throat> uh, industrial and other employment uh, centers develop in this area, that we don't see the same problems that we've seen in other parts of the city. Uh, this is a little bit different than other areas in that this area has not been developed previously, so we're sort of getting out ahead of the pollution. <clears throat> uh, so our desire would be to extend the rules from the Clear Lake Overlay Zone to other industrial areas in the city. Uh, <clears throat> marked in the light blue here. Uh, so, so that's the main goal, is to take these rules that we've already developed, the city has already approved in one area, and then essentially extend them citywide, hopefully with some small improvements. Uh, so this is the list of banned uses for the Clear Lake Overlay Zone. Uh, most of these are <clears throat> uh, have high impacts on public health, uh, or they are nuisance uh, facilities. Um, <clears throat> so things like a racetrack is more of a nuisance, whereas chrome and nickel plating, uh, dry cleaners, these are things that have direct impacts on nearby neighbors. Uh, we're asking the city to potentially add a number of other band uses when they look to expand this, uh, th this overlay zone. So uh, things like explosives manufacturing, uh, wood preservation obviously is a major concern for us given the J.H. Baxter facility. Uh, and then uh, like scrap and dismantling yards. If you uh, saw in the video, the large lot with uh, broken down cars that people can go and get a pick apart lot uh, is having major issues with so, uh, ground, groundwater and soil uh, contamination. Uh, so there are a number of other jurisdictions that have similar rules to this in place. Uh, so the first is uh, Los Angeles has implemented a policy they're calling green zones where they have designated a number of areas around the city as uh, having been affected by industrial air, uh, pollution near them or having uh, 
certain high demographics around low income or BIPOC communities. And so they've designated a number of these green zones and within those green zones, they very similar, they have a banned uses list, they have uh, buffers between, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, buffers between industrial uses and residential uses and a number of rules in place to try and mitigate impacts when those uses are near each other. Uh, the second uh, <clears throat> jurisdiction is Thurs that we're looking at is Thurston County, Washington, and they have a very, very similar banned uses list. Uh, the sort of difference between what, what we have and what they have is that they've also included a standard that says uh, no facility can require extraordinary equipment to control emissions, which means that in, in addition to their banned uses list, they have the standard that if there's some facility that they have not preconceived of as being uh, dangerous, but then as it goes through the planning process, it's obvious it's gonna uh, impact the community in similar ways that their planning department will be able to uh, stop those rules. I think we're gonna take some questions at the end, if that's okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so where would the public health overlay zone apply? So this is a map of the J.H. Baxter site marked in red. Uh, you can see the neighborhoods, the commercial neighbor, sorry, the residential neighborhoods directly to the north across Roosevelt Boulevard. Uh, and so where the crosshatch uh, is in this map is where that banned uses list would apply. Uh, so ideally we would not be seeing, you know, wood preservation facilities, chrome plating facilities, uh, locating in anywhere within the city limits. Uh, and this is how that would apply in the J.H. Baxter area. <clears throat> uh, one of the other rules that's uh, we, from the Clear Lake Overlay Zone is an indoor manufacturing requirement. So everything south of Clear Lake Road, closest to the homes and the parks and the schools, they're saying has to be done indoors. Uh, whenever there's industrial uh, work <clears throat> manufacturing done in a commercial zone, they have an additional requirement that that work both has to be done indoors and it can't have external air emissions outside the building that require an air quality permit. Uh, so essentially saying you can't do anything that needs an air quality, that, that is dangerous enough to require an air quality permit uh, in commercial zones. And we're hoping that that indoor manufacturing requirement will apply within a quarter mile of homes, parks and schools citywide. Uh, and that will add that requirement that will, won't have external air emissions requiring an air quality permit. Uh, and so this is what that would look like, uh, similar near the J.H. Baxter site, a quarter mile from homes along the north end, and then a quarter mile from parks uh, at the center of the map. And again, that can be made stronger by saying that it doesn't, uh, there's no external air emissions requiring an air quality permit. Uh, so in addition, there's a number of areas that have not been developed yet uh, that we are wanting the city to sort of get out ahead of, similar to like they did with the Clear Lake overlay zone. Uh, and so we have areas where we have undeveloped industrial areas right next to undeveloped re uh, residential areas. Uh, there was a big apartment complex put in at 18th and Willow Creek, uh, I believe it was 2021, uh, and literally it's across the street from industrial zones. Uh, and there's a number of other areas that are gonna be converted from ag land to residential land in the near future. And the hope would be that we can get out ahead of that and make sure that we're putting some type of buffer in between those two uh, land use zoning types. And then uh, looking farther out into the future, the city's looking to expand its UGB, U urban growth boundary, uh, potentially all the way out to Fern Ridge Reservoir. And <clears throat> as we extend west uh, or to you know, south or north, we wanna make sure that we just don't make this mistake again. And so the basic point of this slide is to say, you know, if and when we make, do expand the UGB, let's have rules in place that just say that we're not gonna put residential zones directly next to industrial zones in the future, and that we're gonna have some type of buffer in between those, a commercial area uh, or some other zoning type to uh, buffer in between them. Uh, so just to wrap up, uh, <clears throat> we are asking the city of Eugene to create this public health overlay zone uh, modeled after the Clear Lake overlay zone and extend that citywide. Uh, to ban the worst youth land uses, to create this indoor manufacturing requirement uh, near homes, parks, and schools, and to uh, increase some other noise and uh, odor, noise, and vibration standards so that uh, companies moving to, into the area are, are promising that they're not going to uh, affect neighbors in a negative way. And then looking into the future, we're hoping that we can rezone some of these undeveloped areas uh, before they develop where we have these incompatible land use types and create rules so that we don't make this mistake again when we expand the urban growth boundary in the future. Uh, so that's a real high level overview of the public health overlay zone. I'm happy to answer some more questions in a few minutes, but I think we're gonna invite Mason up to talk a little bit about gas stations and uh, how we can affect 
refinement through land use policy in that area. Thank you, Zach. All right, as a brief roadmap, I'm gonna talk about um, kind of why we want to ban the construction of new gas stations. We're gonna focus on health risks, cleanup costs, and fossil fuel reduction goals. Um, and then we're gonna look at Petaluma, California, which was the first in the nation to adopt a policy like this as sort of an example for Eugene and walk through the changes we would make to our land use code um, in order to see these changes. All right, so first off, we kind of um, originated this policy because we had noticed this huge issue of there being a ton of new gas stations being built in the past three years, which I've been calling gas station saturation. Um, so as you guys can see, uh, there are little dots up here, and then around them is uh, a little purple circle that symbolizes about a five minute drive. And everyone within the urban growth boundary can access a gas station really conveniently and easily. Not only that, we have um, these red dots are um, gas stations known to be constructed prior to 2020, and the green ones are ones that have been constructed from 2020 to 2022, and we, particularly dislike this uh, conglomeration of gas stations at Roosevelt Boulevard or Roosevelt Avenue, the same street as G.H. Baxter, um, and Highway 99. Um, and not to mention, as we'll get into it, uh, co-locating gas stations is much, much, much worse um, than just having one there. Uh, there's no real reason for it. I mean, we're not having a capacity issue. There's never like, you know, you go up to the pump and there's a huge line into the street and it's unsafe. Um, everyone's able to get gas when they need it. There's no real reason to be constructing these facilities and allowing de developers to come in, build it and flip it and make a quick profit um, and not worry about the impacts to the community in the future. Um, and the last real reason for this is um, not only does the state of Oregon and many car manufacturers and other entities have a goal to have 100% new um, vehicles sold as electric. Um, and some studies have suggested that 80% of these gas stations you see on this map are gonna be unprofitable by 2035, meaning these are gonna be stranded assets that no one uses, don't make money, don't get taxes, um, and as we, can see, we will see, harm the environment. So the first real reason um, we don't want any more of these is their existence as a public health concern. Um, gas stations primarily produce volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, and they do it in several ways. Um, one, there's a giant storage tank where all of the gasoline is, and when trucks uh, fill that up, um, a lot of the volatile organic compounds get pushed out of this vent or the processor. Um, on hot days, especially during the summer, the gasoline heats up and volatilizes, turns into gas, and that also gets pushed out um, a lot more. Uh, your nozzle permeates VOCs uh, just through the hose, um, and whenever you open your little gas station tank and start fueling and stop fueling, a ton of VOCs just blow out of it. Um, stay tuned on our website. We'll have some videos about that in the future. Um, so there's many sources that these are produced, and this map kind of shows the amount of VOCs produced by each gas station. As you guys can see, your cheap Costco gas produces a lot of VOCs, um, and Fred Meyer fueling is the other major source of it in this city. It's worth noting um, that we calculated the amount of VOCs being produced um, as a measure of throughput using an equation from the Lane Regional Air Protection Agency for Costco specifically. Costco, because of its high throughput, has better control mechanisms to prevent volatile organic compounds from getting out in the environment. So every single one of these other facilities are likely emitting more VOCs than is um, shown on this map. One of those VO, um, a little bit more about VOCs, uh, they're gaseous compounds, they travel long distances, and eventually they're broken down by the sunlight into ground level ozone, which is toxic for our health. It's bad for asthma rates, um, it causes a lot of lung issues. Um, and volatile organic compounds in of themselves have various degrees of toxicity, depending on the ones that you are looking at. A lot of them are known carcinogens um, and cause cancer. One of the more well-known ones is benzene. Um, and so we're gonna do a little bit of a deep dive into that. 
um, around each gas station is a 524 foot buffer. And that has been associated with higher rates of benzene that are known to cause, um, more likely to cause cancer. So living within those 524 foot buffers is extremely hazardous, especially if you're a kid. This has been associated with higher rates of childhood leukemia. And I mean, even if you're an adult, um, benzene is this, uh, these benzene exposures from gas stations are associated with hematologic or blood cancer. Um, so they're not really that great, and a lot of them are near schools, um, and some of the school properties overlap with these 524-foot buffers, but we have a lot of people walking and regularly interacting in these environments, um, and they can get beyond 524 feet. It's worth noting this is just one study that has sort of narrowed down as, as that's the rule of thumb, but there's a few others that we have seen. Um, this is a little zoom in uh, in the Bethel neighborhood. As you guys can see, there are little black dots um, inside of these buffers, and those are houses um, that are right next to gas stations. Um, everyone's market was just approved uh, in this last year. It's currently under construction, and although the residents are very upset about it, the city can't rescind it, and they have to go through with the um, construction of that gas station. Um, it's worth noting that overlapping gas stations is not twice or three times or four times as worse, it's exponentially worse the more you add. So it's not just a factor of how many there are, uh, or it is, but it gets a lot worse the more you have. Um, these gas stations have extremely high cleanup costs. So um, industry moves in, builds a gas station, they refuel, and then they become unprofitable. Um, there's no laws requiring them to tear down the gas station, to make sure the gas tank below them is empty, uh, to take care of any soil or water contamination. So a lot of these become brownfields, um, which are really useless and hard to develop. Um, and we're gonna focus on two examples today. Um, the first one is in Eugene, Oregon. Um, it's near I-5 along the Franklin Boulevard Highway, a uh, section of 99, um, kind of just outside the southwest part of the, southeast part of the city. Um, it was a Franco 15 service station. It was left abandoned after petroleum contamination was discovered on the site. Um, sequential biofuels came in and decided to redevelop it into a gas station, and they got $250,000 to be able to repair the specific soil and water contamination, and they took out a loan of $1.2 million. Some of that money could have been used for the cleanup part of it, but the $1.2 million went towards the whole restoration of the site and construction of the new facility. But they did have $250,000 explicitly earmarked for the purpose of cleaning up this ground and soil water uh, contamination. Example two is in Beaverton, Oregon. We had a Texaco um, converted to a coffee roastery. Again, they spent about $300,000 um, of a cleanup cost. We have seen ranges um, for other facilities closer to a million dollars. So this is a substantial burden on future business owners or people who want to convert these gas stations to um, electric charging stations or other commercial land uses in the future. They're going to have to pay for the cleanup of these fossil fuel companies. Um, so let's not create any more of these hazards and cleanup costs. We have plenty. We don't need to put further burdens on our future community. Um, and, and then zooming out a bit, uh, the city has climate goals. Um, we were supposed to reduce fossil fuels by 50% by 2030, which is marked in the orange line. As you can see, the blue line, we're not doing too hot on that. Um, <laughs> the good news is, just a little bit, is that we are making some um, really great progress towards the amount of electric vehicles that we want on roads. Um, if the green line hits that yellow line and stays at that yellow line for all those years, we'll hit our goal. Um, but with sales increases of about 30% per year, we're estimated to actually blow right past this goal out of the water. So we have people adopting zero emissions of vehicles. Um, there's a really great opportunity here to ban the construction of fossil fuel facilities and to increase the construction of zero emission charging stations. So that brings, um, and really quickly, there's a bit of an issue with in environmental justice here, right? As you guys can see, there's a huge concentration of level two chargers um, around the University of Oregon and downtown neighborhoods. Um, and then there's very few of these electric charging stations out in West Eugene, and their locations are not particularly useful to people. Um, number 14 is at a local utility office, so not a whole lot of people are gonna be making trips out to there unless they're an employee. 
Um, 24 is Lane County Parole and Probation. I don't spend a lot of time out there. Um, and so we really need to be considerate about where we build these charging stations. They need to be at parks. They need to be at grocery stores. They need to be at restaurants. They need to be convenient while you're doing your other task about the day, especially with the high charging time. Um, but there's also DC fast chargers which can charge a car in 15 to 30 minutes. Um, these are ideal to build places, but they're most important to build along travel corridors like I-5 um, coming down the side of the urban growth boundary, Highway 126 towards Florence, um, and probably 99 towards Corvallis. Um, and then when looking at Springfield, we'd also want to consider 126 going towards Bend, but we're a little bit focused on Eugene for here today. So. Petaluma, California in 2021 voted unanimously to ban new gas stations, ban, uh, prevent existing facilities from expanding their fueling capacity, and they um, changed land use rules to easily site electric vehicle and hydrogen fueling stations. Um, it's pretty easy to do this, guys. Um, so here we have the different commercial zoning types here in Eugene. Um, in community commercial, we have a permitted use uh, to be able to build fueling stations, meaning pretty easily a company is able to fill out the permit, submit it to the city, and they're going to approve it because it's a permitted use and deal's done. Um, in C3 major commercial, it's a little bit more difficult than that. The city has to consider surrounding land uses. They have to go through a public hearing process, but ultimately gas stations are still allowed, but there's a few more mechanisms to be able to prevent their construction. Um, we just ban it. We just say, hey, guys, there's no fueling stations allowed. Um, and we change all of those for every single one of these um, different land uses. And then we allow existing fueling stations to continue operating as a non-conforming land use. Um, then Petaluma, uh, first they, uh, so that was a look at Eugene. Um, and now we're looking a little bit more on Petaluma's policy of uh, ZEV's zero emission vehicles. Um, they define zero emission ve uh, vehicle fueling stations as hydrogen or as electric power. Um, and then they defined where they're allowed. They said battery charging stations are allowed as an accessory use on any type of zoning, meaning you're just allowed to build them. And not only that, in their policy languages, we'll see they explicitly said you don't even need a permit for it. So that incentivizes the development by creating less time barriers, less financial barriers to be able to build them, and the people are able to just add them to their various uh, commercial facilities as they see fit. They did allow hydrogen fueling stations um, on a conditional use permit, and they encouraged them to be developed in already existing gas stations. Um, there's, you know, I'll let my other PILK panels kind of cover this topic. We don't have a huge um, stance on hydrogen as a long-term form of um, long-distance transportation, but there's a lot of studies out there that support, you know, that long-term trucking is going to need hydrogen fueling, but um, a lot of the panels that I went to yesterday sort of said this is unrealistic uh, for lighter cars, um, such as your personal travel. So that's something that we might consider, but as an organization, um, we're still kind of figuring out our stance on that. Um, and then they allowed, you know, they, they put in some extra permitting requirements um, for the hydrogen fueling stations. Um, so this is their language. I'm not going to go through all of it, but the important highlights that Petaluma put in here is they said um, gas stations can't expand capacity. They are allowed to do construction that modifies for public safety for traffic or um, uh, to improve groundwater and stormwater quality, and that's all they're really kind of allowed to do. They're not allowed to really develop in any other way as a gas station. They said that once the site is no longer operating as a gas station for 12 months or more, it cannot be a gas station in the future and has to be converted to another land use. They also said that existing gas station facilities can be converted to hydrogen fueling facilities um, or other commercial land uses, so long as you know there's a little bit of cleanup. Um, and then they put in the language here explicitly saying, you don't need a permit for battery charging stations. Let's make it a lot easier. So um, we're immediately recommending that the city of Eugene passes this. Let's get out ahead. Let's prevent more of the bad thing. And let's decrease the red tape for the good thing um, and incentivize that development and meet the demand uh, that people are having for electric vehicles. We need to build out that charging infrastructure as those sales ramp up. But there are other considerations um, that we as a city could consider. One, we could expand local subsidies uh, that already exist through our local utility. Um, we could require gas stations to install electric vehicle 
chargers, just as Germany has done. Um, and one really important thing that we should really get on um, at more of a county level is um, designating alternative fuel corridors. This opens up certain sections of highways and interstates to receive uh, federal funding to build out the charging infrastructure. And Eugene is, is a bit behind. Unfortunately, our rivals in Corvallis have done really good with Highway 20. Um, and so, you know, we really need to consider 126 going all the way to Bend um, and Highway 58 merging with 97 and, and get those as alternative fuel corridors so we can take advantage of funding um, sooner rather than later. Um, and with that, uh, we'd love any questions about everything we've presented on today. Thank you. Measure nine of the state land use planning, you know, where they're saying that there can't be a loss of industrial land. Like, if I say in Portland we want to do, I don't know whether we would call it what you call it, maybe we'll call it something else, but we really want to introduce an overlay zone. But they're going to say that's a loss of um, industrial land. And therefore, we have to increase the urban growth boundary to do that. And um, so I'm just curious. And we feel, are you getting somebody in your city council to back this versus going for a ballot measure? I guess those are my two um, questions about that. Uh, th thank you for the question. Um, so with regards to lo losing industrial land first, uh, the way we're looking at this is that this is tweaking the industrial zoning rules, but the lands would still remain as industrial zones in industrial use for, for purposes of, of the state rulemaking. Uh, so. I don't understand that. So, so for the Clear Lake overlay zone, if maybe we can find yeah, the let's Clear Lake overlay zone uh, map. Um, <clears throat> The land uses in the map that are zoned industrial are still going to be industrial zones, uh, but there's this additional layer of rules that you're putting on top of that. So it's still an industrial zone, but it has this overlay zone on top of it that, that supersedes the rules of the base zone. So as long as they're still allowed to do industrial operations within that area, um, though with these limitations, that it would still be it would still be, be an industrial uh, zone technically, uh, and then with regards to working with city councilors, we've been meeting with city councilors regularly over the last I think, year and a half on this policy. Uh, we've done a number of small group meetings where we have directly impacted neighbors that have met with a number of councilors. Uh, we've heard positive statements of support from pretty much every councilor on the city council, um, but there is uh, unfortunately there's a a lack of land use planning staff within the city of Eugene uh, that have been tasked with a number of other processes that they're supposed to run, uh, uh, including like climate friendly uh, uh, communities rules from the state. And so uh, it's, it's largely a staff capacity issue that we've been running into of the, the city not, simply not having the, the land use planning and the community outreach staff to help them uh, work through this, this workload. But we, we're, we're uh, very optimistic that we will we will be able to move on this policy this year, uh, and that we have uh, may, well maybe not unanimous support, but but large majority support on city council. Uh, Councilor Claire Surrett, that unfortunately that got recalled last year, was a, a real leader on this issue. Uh, Councilor Randy Groves, uh, who actually is the councilor for the JH Baxter site, is uh, in the lead on this issue right now. Uh, we we very much appreciate his leadership as one of the more moderate members of council. Uh, we think we'll be able to get majority support when this comes forward. And, and can this be appealed to LUBA or um, not? It potentially could be, uh, but since the Clear Lake overlay zone uh, that this model is based on has already made it all the way through 
uh, the state land use processes uh, and has already been approved by the state land use. Uh, uh, I believe it's, I think it was, believe it was directly approved by LUBA when we expanded our UGB and applied that Clear Lake Overlay Zone rule. Uh, and so uh, we, we think that the city's on strong footing uh, moving forward that's possible. I, I, I feel like we owe it to you. <laughs> you had your hand in the conversation. It's an observation and a question. Um, so Minneapolis banned gas stations in 2019. Excellent. Yeah, so you should check out what we did. It was in the comp plan, and now we're trying to do it in the zoning, because the zoning's got to comply with the comp plan. And here's the observation, which is, initially the gas stations were going to be legal non-conforming uses, and recently the planners are like, that's too difficult, we're just going to make them permitted grandfathered permitted as opposed to legal not conforming. So watch out for that because that'll make them make it easier for them to expand or whatever. Um, the question is why an overlay zone as opposed to just changing the zoning rules for all the industrial areas in Eugene? Like isn't like just do it everywhere. Yes. No uh, <laughs> so so to, to your point when we first started looking at this policy, we were really focused on the West Eugene neighborhoods yeah. that were most impacted. And so the goal was really to, to look at that industrial corridor along Highway 99, along West 11th, between West 11th and Roosevelt. And as the policy developed and we spoke more with city councilors, the feedback we got from city councilors was, let's just do this citywide. And so an overlay zone might not actually be the correct term anymore. If we're gonna apply it citywide, it would, they would actually probably go into the land use code for industrial zones, commercial zones, residential zones, and actually tweak the rules within the actual zoning code, right? right? And so the idea is we would take what's in the Clear Lake overlay zone, and yeah, it could be done either way. If you were doing it just in the industrial areas, again, you could potentially just do it through an overlay zone, but as you expand to doing it citywide, yes, you're gonna wanna focus in on potentially just changing the underlying zone base zoning rules for industrial areas rather than doing it as an overlay zone on top. Uh, it was just that the, the kernel of the idea really started around the West Eugene community and basing it on the Clear Lake overlay zone and so we've carried that language forward a little bit. But to your point, yeah, it's, it's uh, potentially, uh, yes. <laughs> yes, we should just do it through the base code if we're gonna do it citywide, that's accurate. Yeah, I'm gonna connect with you. I'm doing this right now in Minneapolis, thank you. Um, you mentioned a little bit ago that uh, Clear Strike got a little bit of backlash and was removed from office after like taking on a champion position on some of these subjects. I was wondering if there are any particular city councilors here at Eugene that need more pressure from their constituents to be getting on board with any of these programs. Do I can answer all? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, well, but just 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 overall. Uh, Every counselor we've spoken to is supportive of this policy and uh, is interested in moving it forward in some capacity. Uh, uh, so, you know, whether or not they end up voting for it in the end, I think is another question, but generally we've gotten positive uh, statements of support from all the counselors and specifically Councillor Groves and Councillor Evans, who are the city counselors for the Bethel community and for the areas just south and just north of Roosevelt Avenue where J.H. Baxter is, uh, are uh, the champions of the policy mm -hmm. and so uh, we, we think we're in a good place but yes the more the more support the better uh, we've been going out and talking to a number of neighborhood associations uh, and so we've had we have a number of letters of support from neighborhood associations from around the city and, uh, <clears throat> and and we have a petition on our website that if you go to beyond toxics that we have a website a petition that we'd love to have you sign and uh, but we continue to send out notifications for folks of you know, talk to your counselors, let them know that you support a public health overlay zone uh, in West Eugene. Sign up for our e-alerts. We'll let you know when there's testimony. <laughs> Visit our table <laughs> Out, outside to the left. <laughs> um, hi, Anna Blackley. I'm a 3L from University of Missouri, Kansas City. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the Toxics Right to Know program. Um, so I know the EPA is also required to tell landowners about hazardous waste in the area in a Superfund site. Um, so in regard to this program, I was wondering if there was any 
um, requirement for the landowners to tell their renters about this because I feel like that is something that's a big problem with the federal program where these renters don't know about it. So maybe the landowners know, but the renters don't. And so they're still around this area and have no idea that their health is at risk. So is this program something that addresses that? So the T Toxics Right to Know um, was originally just kind of built out as a policy as, again, a right to know what um, toxics are in the air, and it has more stringent requirements than the EPA's toxics release inventory or our very own Lane Regional Air Protection Agency. They give a lot more in-depth information about what's being produced and how much of it. Um, we're doing an analysis on it right now, and, and what we're finding is that toxics right to know is reporting, reporting more pollution than you know uh, any of these other programs. So that's kind of its intended purpose, is to make the information public. I am unsure if there's any requirements in it to um, make sure people are aware as they purchase these. Yeah, just to state, the, the information is all posted uh, online, and, uh, and then you can also, uh, <clears throat> And so there's actually a report from every single one of the industrial facilities in Eugene of what they're reporting down to the pound. Uh, and uh, so there's not a requirement that, say, a landlord would inform their renter that they live next to a site that's putting out these industrial pollution. But just to state that it is publicly accessible to anyone from the public that wants to look on the City of Eugene website and find that information. unfortunate that they don't have to say that because there is a woman that I know who bought a house during all this whole time that this was going on. She bought a house and didn't know about the pollution and just happened to be watching the news one day and was like, wait a minute. So she reached out to us and she actually paid a thousand some dollars to have her own soil tested. And she did find that there was, there were some dangers there, but she went ahead and bought the house. Can she raise chickens in her backyard and eat the eggs? No. Can she plant how she would like to? Absolutely not. So there should definitely be something in place that folks have to know that because she was an instant victim and that's, that's really not okay. And I just wanted to say about the public health overlay zone, yes, we want it citywide, but my bright eyes, I see it statewide and then I see it worldwide because there's no reason that people should be living that close to these facilities. There's no reason that people should be victimized. They want to live in these homes. They want to celebrate Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever it is that you celebrate. They want to do that in this home that they bought. They want to see their grandchildren in this home that they bought. And unfortunately, a lot of the community members that we know are in a situation where they know that they're living on tainted soil. And that's, that's not fair. So that's my little, that's my thing. <laughs> oh, um, I was going to ask, following on her question, is there a, a map that shows where the uh, blooms of underground, you know, uh, toxins citywide, for example? And if so, you know, uh, how exact is it? So people can just go to a, a certain map and be able to see whether it's whether they're in it. And then the second part of that is. If there is such a map, is it included in the like 35 different um, uh, map overlays that are that the city and the county have in their governmental uh, GIS system? Um, no such map exists, to my knowledge, um, and it really should. And I have been, you know, it's it's something I've wanted to look into. I I'm guessing I don't have the uh, modeling background experience from environmental science to be able to do such a thing, but I would agree that that would be a tremendous resource to develop. Yeah, for sure. I don't mean to interrupt you, Mason. There is a map um, of J.H. Baxter's underwater plume. Um, and I, I mean, you can find it either on the El Rapa website or you can actually see it on our website. I can also leave one of my cards um, with you, sir, if you would like to, so that I can send you that information. There is a map that shows that, but I don't know about citywide, like, like Mason said. Please, and then you, and then you. <laughs> Blue shirt. <laughs> okay, um, two related questions about battlefield sites. Uh, I heard one statement about forced transition after 12 months of inactivity uh, for gas stations. Is that unique to uh, Eugene? Is it unique to gas stations, or have you seen precedents in other jurisdictions for other uses? 
This was um, Petaluma's uh, policy language example. They said, you know, if they abandon it and just leave it there for 12 months, a future developer can't come in and buy it and turn it into a fueling station. It has to be converted to a different use. Yeah, we have that many apples. Yeah, thank you. The other question about uh, earmarked funds. I heard one of the examples about gas stations being cleaned up, uh, and there were funds that were earmarked for that cleanup. Who was it that earmarked those funds? Uh, and have, it is, is financial security something that's ever collected for industrial sites? Yeah. I mean, what was the last part of your questions? Um, is financial security something that's ever collected from industrial sites to make sure that they that they can clean up. That's that's an issue. Yeah, I'll let Zach speak on that. Um, but there is, you know, it looks like these uh, places got um, cleanup grants for brownfields from the EPA. I'd have to look into the Beaverton example and specifically where they got that funds. Uh, generally, the funds, yeah, they've been coming from the, either the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality or from the EPA in terms of the grant funds. Uh, and then with regards to financial securities, I, this is actually. Uh, there's actually a second policy that we've been looking at implementing with regards to the, the issues we've been facing in West Eugene. So the first is the health overlay zone to say, let's not allow any more of these facilities to show up. The second part of the policy is actually an insurance requirement that says that any uh, industrial polluter would actually have to have some minimal level ins of insurance so that if and when they do shut down, that there is uh, monies available to cover cleanup costs uh, or potential impacts on neighbors. Um, generally been referring to that as a, a fossil fuel risk bond, uh, but uh, fossil fuel risk bonds have different definitions and we've they can be like a central fund people pay into to cover costs, but we've really been looking at it as an insurance requirement. Um, and this is an issue where J.H. Baxter actually allowed their insurance to uh, uh, expire before they shut down. And so, uh, yes, that is something we're pursuing. The city council has approved a work session poll on that topic. Uh, but it's sort of uh, uh, next in line down the road once we can get this health overlay zone policy across the finish line would be to institute that insurance requirement. Um, so my question is around some of the future plans for What areas of the and So I think there's a couple questions there. I'll try and, try and cover them. So with regards to, to paint, you know, I think the main things that we're, we're looking at, uh, like chemical, uh, uh, essentially the cooking of chemicals in West Eugene, uh, whether it be uh, uh, paint or some other, uh, you know, chemical that's going to be releasing volatile organic compounds uh, into the air. And then I'm sorry, what was your, your second question? Yeah, like what areas do you think are being um, Yeah. Can, can you go to the first of the, the where yeah. the industrial polluters in Eugene map is? Uh, so, so this is the data from Cleaner Air Oregon, which is a, a process run by the DEQ to clean up the most dangerous sites in the city of Eugene. And uh, it turns out that, <clears throat> uh, you know, the, each of these facilities is, is emitting toxins at different levels and different amounts and of different types. Um, one in particular, Murphy Plywood, is an order of magnitude more dangerous than the next facilities. So hence why it's the only one marked in red. And then you drop down an order of magnitude and we have the sort of the two through six facilities and another order of magnitude, we have the seven through 10. And the green facilities are much less toxic than that top, that top tier uh, rate of polluters. Uh, and so, so this is the, the map that I would point to, which is the data from Cleaner Air Oregon, where they've actually said these are the most dangerous polluters based upon the, the, the data and the math that they use to determine risk factors, uh, looking at how dangerous each chemical is and how closely, uh, how close to residences that that business is located at. Um, and, uh, and so this is the list that I would point to as the, 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 the most risky facilities that we are concerned about. 
uh, and specifically the ones that are marked in red and orange and yellow as those that are the most concerning. Hi, thank you. Um, I had a question earlier in the presentation. You mentioned an Oregon Health Authority study, um, and I was just curious, was that something that they had initiated or that you pushed for as an organization? Um, and if so, what's the process for getting those studies done? And then also just in general, how important are those studies for like getting momentum around these sort of like environmental justice issues? Uh, they're very important <laughs> um, because it gives us something in our, in our backpack. You know, it's like, here it is, you said that these are the, the cancers that have the highest rates. They didn't initiate that, though. No, that was, for be, that was beyond toxics, and the West Eugene community was concerned and said, can you please do another case study? And so they, they did that analysis um, because we asked them to, which was pretty awesome as well. But, um, yeah, I think that those types of studies are really important because it's not just us saying that this is happening. It's the Oregon Health Authority saying that this is happening. So those, those types of studies, they just give us, you know, they give us extra things in our back pocket when we come to places like this to say, these are the facts. If, we, if I'm just standing up here and I'm saying, yeah, my daughter was in that study. She was one of the, the people in the 2018 study. I can say that as much as I want. But if I have a chart that shows that, that makes a huge difference in situations like this, especially. Did you have another question? Um, I have a question about the kind of economic repercussions of shutting down J.H. Baxter and maybe putting some requirements on other industrial um, zones and just like how that might impact the workers who maybe lost their job from that and maybe some alternatives uh, for employment for these people and just kind of how the community responded to that? I'm gonna say that the community was excited that J.H. Baxter was shut down. Um, I'm sure that they're, they're you know, concerned about the jobs. I know that I was concerned about the jobs for the people because they're not, um, I was mostly concerned about the, the families of the people that worked there uh, because they, were, they weren't part of it. You know, whomever the employee was, they chose to work in that, in that environment. Did they deserve to get sick? No. But they chose to work there and they got to go home. The people in West Eugene don't get to go home. That's, that's their home. I don't want to see anybody put out of work, but I don't want to see anybody sick either. And so I, I'm hoping that the families that were impacted by, by the decision of that company closing are doing okay. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not cruel. We're not a cruel organization, but we are there for the people. and. Um, that's, you know, it's one of the repercussions that happened and it's not, it's not fair, but it's also not fair to be living next to some place that you don't get to leave because it's your house. Yeah, I think J.H. Baxter saw the writing on the wall and they pulled the plug, yeah. right? And, and they, they, they made that decision, um, you know, because they were causing huge environmental concerns and it would be expensive to not be operating as they were. And, Therefore, they chose that this is no longer of interest to us for our profits. Um, in terms of facilities immediately impacted by the public health overlay zone, it is a grandfather system. If you have an existing facility there, it is not impacted. Upon the facility's choice to either substantially expand and renovate their operations or sell to another operator, at that point, the um, public health overlay zone requirements will kick in. And so that will be a decision that they make and we're not forcing onto them. Can I follow up? Oh, yeah, please. It's so related, just yeah. a follow-up question on the on the jobs. We're, we're we're trying to study this in Minneapolis. Yes. Is there an overlap between the neighborhood nearby Baxter and the people who work at Baxter, or do the people just come in from other, like? Is there? You know what I mean? Yeah. You know there are. Um, we do health surveys. We go around and we um, do health surveys in that neighborhood, and one of the times. I had knocked on the door and, you know, we were all excited to talk about J.H. Baxter and, and let's hear about your health and are you okay? We were all excited about it and I knocked on the door and that was what I was starting my conversation with. Do you know about J.H. Baxter? Well, the gentleman that opened the door worked at J.H. Baxter. 
sister. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, you don't really want to talk to me, do you? And he actually did because he, his health was impacted. So, you know, there are folks that live right there by J.H. Baxter that, that work there. Um, and, you know, you can run into situations like that. He was very receptive to what we had to say because his health was impacted. But, yeah, it was, it, it was uncomfortable for a second. But, yeah, it's, you, we do run into that for sure. Anybody else? Yep. Yeah. Um, I so I have a few questions, but I'll just, I guess, ask one or two. But, um, so what would you say to residents who are living in, around facilities like these? Um, what are immediate actions that residents can take? I know that, you know, for instance, does an air pressure work? Um, and does it even, like, does an H back versus, for instance, you know, the electric heat pump, what are the differences? Um, where are resources for people to kind of go to, one? And then two, in terms of the timeline for, like, implementation of the land use um, policy, like, um, what are some, like, how would that even look like? Would residents kind of decide, um, like, if there's a need or there can be a neighborhood, like, how, which area gets kind of, like, prioritized? Is there a prioritization process? And then the is, um, in terms of, like, yeah, like, polluters' rights to know, um, yeah, what are some, like, yeah, I guess those are the okay, okay, I think I could start with the first one and I'm gonna hand it over to Zach for the other ones. Um, as far as resources for the community, uh, the, the gal that I showed there in the photo, you have to really get yourself educated about it. You have to want to do something. So she's reached out. She said, what can I do about this? I'm in the community organizer, so I reach out to these folks as well and share resources with them. We do have some um, we do have a, a grant for working with folks like that to work to, to whether it's re, like weatherizing their home or getting them um, uh, HVACs and things like that. Like there, there are resources that are being developed right now because this is happening right now. Um, as far as the other questions, I'm sorry, I'm gonna let. <clears throat> um. So immediate steps, we're actually going out and uh, this afternoon and tomorrow, we're talking to neighbors and getting the, to sign release forms that allows the EPA and DEQ to come onto their property and do the dioxin testing. Um, so I think we, there's been a dozen or so homes tested already. And essentially each time that they test homes um, from the facility, they find dioxin and then they have to go out further. And so I think they've done three rounds of testing now and each round of testing, they've gone further out and they found more dioxins and more and more yards. So uh, we're talking to the neighbors right now and we're trying to make sure that everybody that can get their soil tested is signed up to get their soil tested, uh, to get in line for uh, getting their yards cleaned up through EPA and DEQ funds. <clears throat> uh, at the same time, we also just received a grant uh, from uh, Virtue Labs, uh, I think in association with Business Oregon to actually help neighbors in that area to receive either uh, solar panels or heat pumps. Uh, and heat pumps have the secondary benefit of uh, helping with air quality uh, inside the building as well. Uh, and so that's some of the things that we're working on currently is making sure everybody can get their yards tested and then trying to find benefits uh, in these clean energy retrofits to provide some uh, benefits for people that have had their land values, you know, their land values severely impacted and um, that this, you know, this big polluter next to them not just impacted potentially their health but also their their pocketbook and trying to, to provide some value to that neighborhood. And for like most of the like right to know um, policy, is this all self-reported by the industries themselves? Or is because my understanding is generally that's like a snapshot of time versus like cumulative health impacts. Um, like how, how does that work right down with the policy itself? They, they report on an annual basis and the city essentially posts what they, they put online. To my knowledge, they don't say, you know, you're lying to us and prove it. Uh, uh, they generally just take it and they post it. Um, and we haven't gotten the chance to do like a, an analysis to make sure they're reporting the same thing to different entities. Uh, but uh, yeah. 
Excellent. And, and with that, you know, we've got to uh, leave the room for the next panel, but please uh, come up to any of us uh, and ask any follow-up questions that you still have. We have a table um, outside uh, to your left, um, and we'll be staffed there uh, the rest of the day today. Thank you, guys. Thank you.